Good morning, good morning, good morning. My half, you know what? You want to know something funny about the name of our course? <clears throat> Excuse me. The name of our course is technically <clears throat> Half a Survey, H A V P A. Well, uh, you know, the name just changed this year. Last year was, you know, we called it Arts and Humanities or the state just called it humanities, and now they call it HAVPA survey. Well, here's the thing. Um, for the longest time, I thought it was HAPPA survey. And to be real honest, I couldn't tell you what HAVPA means, uh, you know. Uh, <coughs> it's just <coughs> too early in the morning is what it is. Uh, it's just, you know, one of those things. Uh, that they choose to uh, delineate our courses. Uh, so, yeah, I want to start with a couple of announcements regarding our course uh, that I'll also put in email. Um, you know, so far, for you all, this course has basically just been watch, reading your emails, uh, watching some videos, uh, you know, and, you know, watching these YouTube uh, broadcasts. Which, you know, I noticed yesterday our viewership was uh, 23 or so, which is about the size of our class. Now, I have, right now, I have no way of telling uh, exactly who's tuning in and who's not tuning in. But um, we do have to have accountability in, in this course. I mean, we are covering material and we have to uh, assess how much of that material you're retaining. And so what I am learning to do, and I'm picking up on it, is how to create assessments. And these assessments will come to you via Canvas. And I'll tell you when they're going to happen. And these assessments in Canvas have, uh, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this, you've done Canvas and other things, have a time lock. In other words, uh, you are allowed a certain amount of time to take the test, and there's a time lock as to when you can take it. And I will, when we finish this chapter, we will be having an assessment via uh, YouTube, YouTube, not YouTube, uh, via Canvas, you know. Um, and that assessment uh, will, you know, will be graded. Uh, and so we'll, and the, the more I learn about Canvas, the more I learn about assessment. Uh, I'll vary them going down the line, but right now, yeah, we will uh, start with that. And, um, you know, I already got after my uh, my other class, my AP Euro class this morning. Um, please do the right things. And by that, do the right things. Uh, <coughs> Governor Bashir uh, got on television yesterday with his daily report and he actually was uh, quite unhappy with certain many people in the state and uh, the occasion was that there was one young man uh, who was like 23 or 24 college age actually uh, who had attended a coronavirus party and after that became infected and his infection then, of course, risks not only his health, because believe it or not, uh, across this country, as, uh, as compared to China, across this country, uh, the coronavirus, 80% uh, of the cases are between the ages of, you know, um, 18 and 50. I mean, it's not just hitting the elderly. And so that young man endangered, of course, not only his health, it endangered the, the health of the health care workers. And right now in Ohio, health care workers make up 16%, 16% of the total number of people infected and never care of people like me and you uh, on the occasion we go to the hospital. Uh, and um, not only endangered their health, but of course he is endangering the health of people with which he comes in contact with either you know his friends or goodness his family and so you know i'm just admonishing you um what we're doing think about it what we're doing with this coronavirus is this 
we have no immunity to it unless you get the virus and then recover which you know is rather difficult to do and also quite uh, you know it's not a pleasant experience not only that once again you endanger the health of all those other people scratching his face uh, but once uh, there is no in immunity unless you've got the virus uh, but for the rest of us, what we're doing, we're hiding from the virus. That's our hope, because right now there is no vaccine. And so, uh, you know, when you go out there and expose yourself to the virus, you make it more difficult for the rest of us to hide, uh, which is with all the technology we have, with all the science we have, that's right now our best strategy to hide from the virus and hope that eventually it washes through and goes away and then we can assume some kind of a normal life uh, again and yeah so please do the right things um, and so yeah so those are the two big announcements today one i mean you know what are you supposed to do you're supposed to monitor your emails you're supposed to uh, watch the films and things i have for you to do uh, and yes, look at Canvas because every day I post some I post something on YouTube. I then also put it on Canvas in Pages. And in the future, there will be a uh, an assessment for you, and that assessment will contain a parameter of time in which you can take it. And after that, you know, um, you still have to pass this class. And uh, you know next year i mean when you are most of my students in uh, in uh have have pa are uh, <clears throat> underclassmen they will have that credit so they don't have to worry about taking it over again anyway let's uh talk about this uh, um what were we talking about? oh yes uh, yes, we were talking about uh, the art of Northern Europe, the Northern Renaissance. Um, in Northern Europe, the artists of the Northern Renaissance became less preoccupied with purely religious themes and became more and more involved in humanism. In other words, the, you know, basically this guy, you know, painting regular people doing regular things, humanism life on earth and used art to reflect the position of man on earth northern painters once again preferred oil on wood and canvas canvas yes uh to frescoes uh well because once again the climate just didn't suit in northern europe the climate was not good for frescoes artworks often found inside the doors of altar pieces and last night i sent you an altar piece now that altar piece is not the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, I can, I will later send you a picture of the Ghent altarpiece. Um, there's a faint, very good movie that we would have watched a part of. If we were here, called uh, The Monuments Men. Uh, some of you may have seen it. It's a World War II film, uh, and it's about a true story where during World War II, um, the Nazis um, were snatching up all the great pieces of art. Uh, throughout Western Europe for the purposes of building Adolf Hitler this ginormous, the world's biggest art museum. Hitler loved art. And so the Nazis were stealing all these pieces of art, all the greatest pieces of art from all over Europe. And uh, one of the pieces they stole was the Ghent altarpiece. And uh, the, they then hid the altarpieces while they waited for this as the war began to turn the other way, the Nazis hid these pieces and actually threatened to destroy them. And they actually did destroy a numerous uh, art pieces. Uh, but yeah, one of those pieces was the Ghent altarpiece. And I showed you a picture of an altarpiece that I took when I was at the University, or rather the uh, Cincinnati Art Museum. Yeah, that's an, art, uh, an altarpiece, it's not the altarpiece. But it just goes to show you that if you want to find works of art without going to Europe uh, or the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, the art the Art Museum of Cincinnati is uh, free most of the time. 
and has some nice pieces of art. It has an had an altar piece. And once again, an altar piece um, would be placed at the front of the church, uh, right on the altar. And the altar piece was like a giant uh, series of doors that would unfold. And on the inside would be a, a depiction of several pieces, uh, depictions of religious stories and things like that. And all of it would be wood, uh, oil panel, oil painting on wood panel. And uh, yeah, the most famous of these, once again, was the Gent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck. Uh, and I'll send you a picture of that, I promise. Um, now, the picture I just sent you via email uh, is the marriage of Giovanni Arnolfini and Giovanni Tsunami, uh, which is another oil on wood panel painting. The thing about that painting, and it is one of the great masterpieces of the Northern Renaissance, the thing about that painting was that it's actually really, it's like the Mona Lisa, it's actually really small. It's about, I think about 20, maybe, I think it's 30 inches square. And uh, inside of it though, it's another oil on wood panel, inside of it that it just shows the marriage of this merchant, this Dutch merchant, uh, I'm sorry, this Italian merchant, uh, and his wife. And in it, there are several elements of uh, art. For example, uh, if you look at your study guide, the dog. Uh, dogs in art symbolize what is called fidelity. Uh, fidelity comes from the Latin word. I'm sure my students who are going in the armed forces can say, uh, Semper Fidelis, which is the motto of the uh, United States Marine Corps, means always faithful. Uh, fidelity means faithfulness in America. So placing a dog in a painting is a symbol that this couple is married and they will be faithful to each other. Uh, there is a single candle in that painting that I sent you in the window. That represents the light of Christ in their life. But also, and this is difficult to see, but I think that the, the painting I sent you blows up nicely so that you can see in the background there's a little convex mirror now a convex mirror is one that uh, is convex to the outside so that it gets a broader view and if you look closely in there you can actually see uh, uh, oh, what's his name uh, Jan van Eyck the painter as he's painting the painting uh, the first genuinely humanist painter of the Northern Renaissance was uh, Albert Dürer. Albert Dürer did a series of self-portraits. Uh, he also did a uh, engraving of Night, the Death, Night, Death, and the Devil, which comes from an old story. Uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder then further immersed himself in humanism. Um, his famous painting was The Hunter's Return. Now that one I sent you last night. Uh, and this is humanist. This is what is called genre, G-E-N-R-E, -E, genre painting. Genre paintings are paintings that depict ordinary, everyday people doing ordinary, everyday things. And in The Hunter's Return, it just shows a bunch of hunters returning from the hunt and it's overlooking a village. And, you know, it, uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's uh, there last night. What is humanist about that painting is, like I said, it's depicts, it depicts uh, ordinary people. Uh, it depicts ordinary people doing quite ordinary things. My son just texted me. Uh, so, now, Roman numeral seven. Uh, Northern humanists, as they were called, were often called Christian humanists to distinguish them from the classical humanists of Italy. The northern humanists, and this will be on your test, were very, very concerned with uh, social problems. Uh, were very concerned with uh, the problems of human beings, very uh, the problems of society. Uh, one such humanist was Desiderius Erasmus. Erasmus, E-R-A-S-M-U-S, -S, uh, and this is all in your study guide. Uh, his best work was a book a pamphlet called In Praise of Folly, which was a work of satire, S-A-T-I-R-E. We've talked about satire before. 
Satire is a type of humor that um, pokes fun at something that is serious. It pokes fun of something that is real and serious with the purpose of that being to draw attention to that something. I mean, for example, and uh, I don't know how many of you watch Saturday Night Live. <coughs> I do. I mean, Saturday Night Live is almost nothing but satire. You know, it, uh, particularly when they do their political skits, their opening sequences, uh, it's, you know, making fun of political leaders, uh, you know, and things of that nature. They even did one a few weeks back about the coronavirus, uh, where these, uh, they tried to produce a television show, uh, a soap opera, in the days of the coronavirus, where, of course, the actors can't even get close to each other. I don't know about you, but uh, that's one of my first thoughts when I sit there and I watch, uh, when I sit there and I watch uh, the, uh, oh. when I sit there and I, I watch my son, text. he doesn't text me often, so yeah, I got to pay attention to him. When I sit there and I watch television shows, one of the things that I keep thinking about, how did all, how did all those people, and you know, I know these television shows were produced months ago, but still, I, my first thought is, wow, they're awful close together. Anyway, uh, his work was in praise of folly, uh, a work of satire that criticized society through exaggeration and parody. I mean, that's exactly what Saturday Night Live does. Uh, Erasmus pointed his finger uh, mainly at the vanity and the sinfulness uh, he felt existed in the Renaissance as it had forgotten an emphasis on Christianity. Uh, Erasmus also wrote a Greek translation of the Bible with his own commentary in which he actually dared to show the errors made in the Latin version of the Bible, pardon me, which had been the standard issue of the Christian, the Catholic Church for a thousand years. And that was a dangerous thing to do to actually criticize the way the Roman Catholic Church translated the Bible. Uh, another of the great humanists was your friend and mine, and Henry VIII's friend, Sir Thomas More. Yes, Thomas More, his childhood friend, whom he uh, had beheaded. More, who was a friend of Erasmus, uh, they referred to themselves as the Oxford Reformers, wrote a satire of his own called Utopia. Uh, Utopia, if you recall, if you recall, the Greek uh, philosopher Plato had once written a book about a place called Utopia. Uh, Utopia was a fictional island where the inhabitants had solved all the problems of war, poverty, and crime. It was written in Latin. Uh, on this island, everybody wore the same clothing made of wool. Everybody went to bed at 8 o'clock. Evening lectures were about self, were about education and self improvement. Uh, illicit sex, criminal activity were harshly punished. Utopians did not need money because all material needs were satisfied with a few hours of labor. You see, Utopia uh, in the original translation uh, of uh, Plato translated into no place. Um, Thomas More's Utopia people think of it as the ideal place. And so the word utopia, utopian, uh, refers to this place where everybody's problems solved. And so, yeah. But as we all already know, Thomas More was beheaded as a result of his moral conscience by his childhood friend, none other than Henry VIII. Michel de Montaigne uh, wrote an intensive introspection. Of, in other words, he wrote about himself. He basically talked about his own self and his own feeling, and he invented, and this is on your test, a form of literature called the essay, uh, which if you're following along study guide, it says which you can write for $20 and ha ha ha. Uh, while we're talking about satire, I mean, uh, please don't home tell your parents that mom, Ms. Torton said I should watch South Park. Uh, I didn't say that. Although, I mean, uh, South Park, they uh, they go after they go after everything and everybody, uh, you know, and they are vulgar. That's the thing. Caveat, caveat. They are vulgar. 
if you're offended by vulgarity, do not ever watch them. Um, but anyway, uh, they did this one episode where the four kids, who are the centerpiece of South Park, uh, Cartman, uh, oh, I don't know the other three. Cartman, of course, is most famous. Kenny. Uh, but anyway, they are given an assignment to write a uh, book report on uh, the book, The Old Man in the Sea. And so uh, Cartman, who is always resourceful about coming up with ways to get out of work, says, I know what we'll do. We'll go down by, you know, the docks. And, and you know, Cartman is, you know, the show makes, doesn't try to hide racism and exposes it for what it is. It says, we'll go down by the docks and we'll hire some of these uh, immigrants, Mexicans, uh, to write the essay for us. And so they go down to the docks and Cartman, you know, negotiates and says, here, you write essay and I will give you $20. Well, uh, what, what, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Halleck. What Cartman, uh, rather what Cartman and the boys did not understand was that in uh, Latino slang, essay is friend. And so basically they were telling them to write a letter, write their friends and for $20. And they, okay, sure. And so they all wrote their friends for $20. And I, the funniest thing is when they're back in the class and none of them have their essays, uh, except Butters, he wasn't in on the deal. Uh, was it Butters or was it, oh, I forget what the other kid's name. He said, uh, no, but I, ha I got a letter from my essay. And so you know, that's funny. But anyway, uh, yeah, Michelle de Montaigne wrote the essay, or rather invented the essay. And the essay is just a short document that talks about something. It has a point. You say much like this, that story about South Park. Okay, let's shift gears. And if you were wondering about what was happening back in England with the Tudors, so yes, Henry VIII eventually died. And his, the heir to the throne, uh, the heir to his throne was Edward the Fourth. He didn't live very long because, once again, he was sickly when he was born. Uh, during his short reign, he, his regents, the people who were running things for him, actually continued to pass um, Protestant-type uh, legislation. England became a more Protestant country. Under Edward the Fourth, although the kid couldn't tell you what was going on, I think he died when he was like eleven years old. Uh, and so, yeah, Henry the uh, Eighth died, and then came Mary. Now, oh, excuse me. I hate these lights. Thank you. And then came Mary. Now, like it says in your study guide, and like it says in your uh, email just now, Mary had been living in a convent, one of the most fun places in the world. Mary was quite unhappy with what had happened to her mother, uh, Catherine of Aragon, and Mary was going to come back and be the Queen of England, and she was going to totally undo everything that her father Henry VIII had done. She was going to convert uh, England back to Roman Catholicism one way or the other, which if you uh, get to watch that opening scene, and hopefully you will in an uh, event after this lecture, watch that opening scene. Uh, I mean, you could always pause me and go to it. That opening scene that I sent you in the email of from the film Elizabeth, where those three, uh, Master Ridley, the, the three Protestants were taken they had their hair and you know you can see them they cut their hair off to humiliate them and then they walk them out and tie them up and burn them at uh burn them at the stake and you notice you listen to what the catholic priest is sitting there they're being burned uh they're described as protestant heretics they're being burned and their souls are being condemned to hell forever and ever and ever uh yeah uh, that's how it begins and so yeah, Mary then, of course, is Queen of England, but, and she actually thinks, if you watch the film, she actually thought she was with child. Uh, she had married, Mary had married Philip II, King of Spain. 
And uh, once again, another political uh, marriage. Uh, Philip, um, you know, he married uh, Mary because it was it was a good political arrangement. Uh, and um, I really wish you could watch the whole film. We could watch more of the film together. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, it was a marriage that was hardly consummated. They didn't have sex. Uh, you know, uh, Philip didn't find Mary particularly attractive. And even though Mary thinks she is expecting, well, what she's expecting, she doesn't know it, is a tumor. And she is dying. She doesn't know it. And the tumor is driving her crazy. And uh, so, yeah. So as it says there, uh, Elizabeth barely survived her childhood as she had to dodge her somewhat crazy half-sister who was intent on restoring England Catholicism. Um, oh, sorry. Elizabeth also had to dodge numerous plots against her life, one of which may or not have originated with her own cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Now, when Elizabeth was a young lady, as I said before, England was ruled for a time by the man who had, by the, yeah, by the man who had executed her mother, Anne Boleyn. That was Henry VIII. Then she had to live through the rule of Mary, you know, crazy bl bloody Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, who executed so many Anglicans, Protestants, that she became known as Bloody Mary. Elizabeth was an Anglican, and somehow she avoided execution and eventually became queen. Uh, Mary died and suddenly Elizabeth was queen to a land that may or may not have desired a queen, may or may not, and they sure didn't, were unsure about desiring a Roman Catholic. There was a large Roman Catholic population in England at the time. Uh, she was received warmly at first, uh, but Elizabeth made an art form out of dodging uh, both assassins and marital suitors. I mean, when Elizabeth became queen, a lot of people tried to kill her. And a lot of people tried to marry her. She didn't uh, fall prey to either one of them, uh, which is quite uh, remarkable. And Elizabeth was a remarkable person. She will rule England for somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 years uh, before she herself finally dies. And she will inherit an England that is bankrupt, that has no standing army, that has a very small navy, and by the time she is dead, uh, England will be the world's number one naval power, a, a position they will not relinquish until the middle of World War II, and uh, will be one of the most powerful countries in the world. And um, the religious question will be halfway settled. Now, Elizabeth was able to do that. Uh, because Elizabeth uh, is a person who, as it says, put political ends above her religious convictions. Historians call this type of ruler a politique, P-O-L-I-T-I-Q-U-E, which is written in your study guide right there. And that is a good word for a test question. Now, I want you then to look at the other videos. And uh, tonight I'm going to send you some more works of the Northern Renaissance, uh, including the, uh, the painting that's called The Northern Mona Lisa, uh, Girl with Pearl Earring, which if you come to my room, uh, as you have been for the last three quarters, and look up, it's uh, featured prominently in my room. It's called Girl with Pearl Earring. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about Shakespeare. I will also tell you that we're approaching the end of this unit, and I intend to have a test ready for you. Um, by the time we get to the end of that. So it's now 30 minutes into this lecture. I hope you all have a good day, uh, and I will see you tomorrow. I'll look for my emails tonight and continue to look for me on Canvas, but yes, emails and YouTube. Bye for now.